So welcome everybody. I'm a Shannon Bennett. I'm chief of science and an infectious disease microbial biologist, a virologist. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Suzanne Pierre here today. Um, before I introduce her, I'm just gonna remind everybody of some best practices. Please uh, mute yourselves, uh, turn off your cameras. And I wanna let you all know that we are recording this lecture. And then finally, if you have questions, please type in a question mark into the chat and Dr. Alejandra Hernandez will uh, facilitate the question period at the end of Sue's lecture. So with that, thank you so much, Sue. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our seminar series. In particular, I also wanna congratulate you. Dr. Uh, Suzanne Pierre is our Osher Fellow this year. And in the Osher Fellowship role, she'll be working closely uh, with us to really bring a lens of science to how humans interact with nature that aligns very well with our emerging strategy, how we want to connect humans to nature, but importantly, how we want to bring the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the accessibility to nature and how people relate to nature. And Sue's particularly pushed the envelope in terms of her scientific work in exploring the human natural connection, but particularly as it's driven by exploitative uh, societal drivers. And so this is gonna be super important for all of us to think about as we look at how humans interact with nature. What really excites me about Sue's background is that she uh, works in, in, in a soil medium in some cases to look at how soils record the imprint of the human natural relationship through these uh, exploitative processes, looking both at abiotic and microbial sectors. So. Yay, I'm excited. Um, so Sue comes to us from a PhD program at UC Berkeley. Uh, she completed that program in 2018. Uh, she was awarded uh, an NSF fellowship in diversity to complete that program. And then she was also awarded the president's um, uh, the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship to continue working at Berkeley in um, Ted Dawson's lab, and um, uh, as well as Mary Firestone's lab. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sue has led in and, and is the founder of is a, is a space called critical ecology. And this is really where she's started to define the science behind um, tracking human natural interactions through the exploitative arc of society. So without further ado, I'm very excited to uh, let Sue take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Shannon. Um... Uh, just for record, um, I didn't do my PhD at Berkeley. I did my PhD at Cornell um, and then came to Berkeley more recently. So, um, but it's been a really great time um, working with um, the Dawson lab there at Berkeley and the Firestone lab. So thanks so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and you uh, did a great job of kind of um, segueing um, us into what I will um, introduced today, which starts with my past research in um, global change ecology, um, focused on the ways in which um, global change, so climate and other um, uh, biotic and abiotic uh, ecological changes are influencing the interactions between microbes and plants um, in the terrestrial environment. And then I will introduce some work that I have begun in the last several years looking at um, this uh, area called critical ecology. And as my talk is um, titled here, towards a critical ecology of global change. So um, I hope to offer you all um, a, a sort of novel lens um, for looking at global ecological change that um, I hope that you find compelling. So um, just to orient you all to uh, how this talk will be structured, um, I'll first talk about some of my past research, which I um, just described really briefly. Um, but then I will kind of transition us into um, talking about what I see as the kind of gaps in the research um, for global ecological change and um, why those gaps are important for how we will continue to, um, in the future, understand um, the biotic and abiotic factors that are shifting um, and having feedback effects to um, both society um, and the environment. Um, and then I'm going to offer us kind of an, uh, as I mentioned, a new um, framework, a novel framework for understanding um, how global environmental change um, has in the past and will in the future um, shape uh, ecology. And then I will share a few of the ongoing, well, one really, but I'll, I'll introduce 
um, one among others of um, the ongoing projects that I'm doing with my um, organization, which Shannon introduced called the Critical Ecology Lab. So um, I'll start by just saying, I describe myself as a global change ecologist. Um, my training is in um, ecosystems ecology focused on forests and soils um, and biogeochemistry of soils um, with a focus um, additionally on microbial ecology. And so the reasons that I kind of um, gravitated to those areas um, uh, are related to my um, excitement for this um, idea of resource availability shaping um, ecosystems. And um, these are some of the factors that I really find compelling when I think about resource availability in the terrestrial environment. We know that lithology is very important for kind of um, establishing the fundamental availability of mineral uh, resources for, uh, for biology. We understand that disturbance is um, critical for kind of um, structuring the um, distribution of resources um, over time and in space. Um, I think a lot and care a lot about the ways in which microbial function um, is kind of a modulator of resource availability, particularly to plants, um, but of course through trophic interactions, ultimately um, all uh, levels of the ecosystem, the biotic ecosystem. And I'm very interested in the ways in which plant traits um, can be distributed in space and over time, and how those traits um, are both responsive to the abiotic environment, but also have feedback effects to, um, to the uh, environmental factors that, that continue to shape these other um, three uh, resource availability um, factors. I'm gonna use the word factors a number of time and I, not times, and I need to just get used to that. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, and, um, as a kind of framework for thinking about resource availability, I'm really compelled by um, thinking about um, gradients of resource avail availability um, as a way to kind of organize um, how traits in, um, uh, in organisms, both plants and microbes um, in my work are uh, distributed. So when I think about, um, okay, when I think about, um, a spectrum of resource availability at the low end of, um, of access to resources, we think about organisms that show um, slower rates of growth um, and respiration, um, potentially lower re uh, resource um, investment and reproduction, um, greater defenses um, and our uh, tendencies towards or trades towards avoidance um, of risk um, and lower biomass turnover. Um, and on the high end of resource availability, we tend to see organisms with traits um, such as fast growth and respiration, um, higher reproductive, or wow, that's, I should flip that, Lo lower reproductive investment um, in individual uh, uh, offspring, lower defense avoidance behaviors, um, and high turnover of their biomass. And so these kind of really broad categories of um, uh, resource, um, resource supply traits um, are really interesting to me and um, the ways in which they inform or um, impact uh, terrestrial biogeochemistry were some of the um, earliest motivations for um, my research interests. So one of the main questions that I kind of um, focused on um, is how does climate change influence the microbial um, community composition and thereby function in the terrestrial ecosystem? So I am I'm particularly interested in these two major factors of um, the abiotic environment, so temperature and moisture. And we know that um, microbes, like all organisms, are responsive to these two um, kind of major climate drivers. Um, and it's uh, particularly interesting if we, um, and I'm sure many of uh, the people on this call today um, are aware, if we think about um, if we think about the microbial community as um, being um, uh, a kind of bottleneck for the availability of resources to primary producers. And so when the frame that I kind of approach microbial ecology from is, um, is in the uh, vein of um, thinking of them, uh, thinking of microbes as being um, essentially um, kind of the valve for the, the critical nutrients that are required for primary production. Um, and we know also that um, the traits that microbes, microbial co communities um, uh, 
contain um, can work reciprocally across resource gradients. So the microbes themselves being um, influenced by the availability of kind of these um, baseline abiotic resources, like I mentioned, um, lithology, disturbance, um, and climate, um, but the ways that microbes then kind of feed back to or, or impact um, the terrestrial environment um, in terms of uh, plant growth, um, community structure, and function are, um, are equally important and equally interesting in the, um, with the umbrella of, uh, within the umbrella of climate change. So um, some of the themes that I'll talk about in this first part of my talk are um, thinking about what feedbacks between plants and microbes um, in terms of physiology um, impact nutrient cycling, um, thinking about uh, how spatial distributions of bioeconomic traits um, influence biogeochemistry under climate change. And then also, um, I will also later get into um, how social processes, so um, the, the human and societal um, kind of influences, both directly and indirectly establish and maintain ecological syndromes that are um, spatially and temporally predictable. So uh, first, I'm just gonna share with you this really classic diagram, the Whitaker diagram, um, which shows the distribution of um, bi terrestrial biomes, I shouldn't say biomes, sorry, all the aquatic folks, um, terrestrial biomes across um, in a, a precipitation and temperature space. Um, so we know that biomes are organized this way um, by these two major factors, and um, this is kind of at the foundation of um, ecosystems ecology. Um, what I'm very interested in is, is how the distribution of nutrient, sorry, <laughs> nutrient cycling functions um, that um, microbes carry out in the terrestrial environment give rise to distinct biogeochemical um, syndromes within these um, different environments. And if we know that they are distributed um, along these two axes of temperature and precipitation, um, we can also um, infer that microbial functions may also be distributed along these axes. And so um, I'm gonna move <laughs> somewhat quickly through um, these next two parts. So um, please bear with me, um, but I, I'm doing this just so that we have enough time to get into the critical ecology piece of the talk. So um, one way in which you might um, approach a question about temperature in the natural environment would be to use a mean annual temperature gradient um, in the form of an elevation gradient to substitute space for climate. And um, the study that I'm gonna uh, share with you right now um, is based um, on the big island of Hawaii on the Mauna Kea volcano. And um, at that site, I was able to use um, an existing temperature gradient established by uh, Creighton Litton and Christian Giardina who are um, at uh, University of Hawaii um, at Manoa. And um, we used this kind of space for climate substitution um, to look at natural variation in um, microbial community function um, in the absence of variation in other ecological properties. So we focused, we, we selected the, these um, plots uh, at this site because of um, a continuous um, lithology across the gradient. So um, being that Hawaii is a volcanic island, we knew that um, the soils were all um, basically, uh, what is the word that I'm forgetting? We, we knew that um, the soil formation uh, began at the same time because of a single lava flow being um, laid down um, at one time. Um, so we could assume that soil age was consistent across the gradient, or it was established that soil age was um, consistent across the gradient. Um, we also knew that across the um, temperature gradient, um, vegetation was consistent. So um, dominant canopy and mid, mid canopy um, trees were consistent from the highest elevation to the lowest elevation. Um, and we also knew that there was no uh, precipitation gradient um, or rather the precip precipitation gradient was slight and um, was compensated for um, by this temperature gradient so that soil moisture was consistent across the gradient. And before I move on, I wanna acknowledge that um, this uh, work was done on the island of Hawaii, which is um, which is stolen land, and um, we want to uh, make a point to say that acknowledgement of indigenous um, land sovereignty and uh, ongoing struggles for land sovereignty by Hawaiian people um, 
it's not enough to simply acknowledge it, but uh, for now, we wanna just um, make space in research talks to, um, yeah, to basically say that our work is not possible without um, the kind of uh, losses that uh, indigenous people have suffered. And that's true for all um, field research more or less. So um, I just wanna insufficiently, but um, wholeheartedly give that acknowledgement. And so um, having shared with you what the study site looks like, um, some of the questions that this first uh, piece of my research um, aimed to ask are one, um, does mean annual temperature or do mean annual temperature and bioavailability co-vary predictably across um, a gradient of 5.2 degrees Celsius? So um, a difference of 5.2 degrees Celsius from the highest elevation to the lowest elevation on, this, um, on the um, temperature gradient. And also I asked, um, do nitrification gene abundance and or gene expression explain the nitrogen bioavailability that we observe across this mean annual temperature gradient? So um, just quickly, some of the methods that I used for the study um, include um, first looking at ammonium and nitrate bioavailability using ion exchange, re exchange resins across this gradient. Um, we, uh, I sampled um, DNA and RNA from soils across the gradient as well. Um, and did clone library assembly and um, created a phylogeny of the ammonium monooxygenase gene, um, which encodes um, ammonium monooxygenase, the enzyme involved in um, nitrification, uh, one of the rate limiting steps in nitrification, uh, which I guess should, I should add nitrification is um, a critical step in the nitrogen cycle, which regulates the availability of mineral nitrogen to um, terrestrial plants. Um, and it is uh, closely linked with um, uh, the availability of nitrogen for primary production, among other nitrogen cycling processes. Um, and then uh, our final piece um, in methods uh, was primer design for AMOA that was specific to um, the AMOA uh, uh, sequences that were um, identified, that I identified in these soils in Hawaii, um, and then um, quantitative PCR to um, look at the um, abundance and expression of this gene. So the first piece of data I'll show you, um, just to orient you to this figure, um, you'll see a mean annual temperature in degrees Celsius on the um, x-axis um, pretty consistently for the next few slides. So um, that should be, uh, you should get comfortable with that, that piece. Um, and then here on the uh, y-axis, uh, I'm showing you total bioavailable nitrogen in nitrate and ammonium forms. And this again was measured um, using ion exchange resins. And so um, the first piece of uh, data, which was very exciting to me, was to find that um, bioavailable nitrogen did increase um, predictably across temperatures. So warming led to um, an increase in the availability of nitrogen. And so this is not um, a mechanistic answer for why we might see an increase in nitrogen availability, but it was the first piece of evidence to show that temperature is doing something different um, depending on, um, or uh, nitrogen availability is changing <laughs> depending on um, temperature. Oof, that was, that was hard. Um, so as I mentioned, we, um, I created a phylogeny of the ammonium monooxygenase gene for the soils at this, along this gradient. And um, we showed that there were three major phylotypes of um, uh, AMOA uh, in these soils. And what that really just means is that um, I designed primers around three phylotypes and um, basically treated those as our, our major groups of ammonium, um, ammonia oxidizing bacteria and archaea. So, um, oh, excuse me, uh, just archaea because we did not find bacterial nitrifiers in these soils. That's not super surprising. Um, uh, bacterial nitrifiers are found in um, aquatic systems largely, um, as well as in terrestrial systems. But um, a lot of the research um, most recently about um, ammonia oxidizers and nitrifiers um, show that arch archaea are actually the um, dominant contributors to, these, um, to this uh, step of the nitrogen cycle. So, um, Again, this figure is showing you um, mean annual temperature from um, 13 degrees Celsius to 18 degrees Celsius on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you'll see that um, I'm showing the mean um, ammo uh, ammonium, excuse me. <laughs> um, these are archaeal ammonia oxidizers. Um, so um, AOA is um, ammonium ox ammonia oxidizing archaea. Oof, 
And um, I'm showing you the mean abundance in terms of gene copy numbers across in, found in soils across um, this temperature gradient. Um, and again, we find that um, there is a significant relationship between temperature and the abundance of this functional gene, which um, is related to the availability of nitrate in soils. Um, so this is a further um, piece of evidence that um, showed that the, uh, the influence of temperature is not simply um, increasing nitrogen availability in an abiotic way, but that it's linked to the functional gene that's actually producing um, nitrate uh, in these soils. And um, here I'm showing you just the same data, but I'm showing um, the AOA um, uh, ammonium monooxygenase gene abundance on the x-axis and then um, nitrate bioavailability on the y-axis. And I'm just showing it this way because um, nitrate is the product um, of the um, um, ammonia oxidation process. And so we see this really nice relationship between the abundance of the gene and, um, uh, and when I say nice relationship, I mean, in a natural system, in ecology, we don't usually see um, this uh, level of relationship for soils. And so this was just further um, a, another nice way to show the relationship between um, function and product um, in an ecologically meaningful way. And we did look at gene expression for the ammonium monooxygenase gene, um, and that actually had no relationship to mean annual temperature, which is very interesting because um, I hypothesized um, before, before beginning this study, I hypothesized that temperature would have an, in, an, an influence on gene expression as well. And it turns out it's not actually upregulating um, the transcription of the AMOA gene. Um, more, more likely, we're seeing a change in the population of ammonia oxidizers in these soils. And so um, if a, a, a change in um, a functional population is related to temperature, um, this is still ecologically interesting and significant because it may have this implication for um, how um, a, a functional community in um, a soil microbial community may be linked to changes in the plant community. And I don't have time to get um, super deeply into this, but at this site, we do see that with increasing temperature, there's an increase in live biomass, um, uh, standing biomass as well. And um, this, is, uh, this goes to show that there is um, a change in resource availability that may be um, influencing um, standing biomass in so in excuse me in this forest um, and whether this has um, to do with other factors in the nitrogen cycle including um, nitrogen fixation I wasn't able to look at but um, this relationship between um, temperature and a functional gene at the ecosystem scale um, had had not really been shown um, in a with regard to um, the nitrogen cycle. And this was um, a really exciting finding um, to show at the scale of um, an entire mountain. So um, just to wrap this piece up, um, we found that nitrogen becomes more bioavailable with uh, warmer air temperatures, um, that the warming also seems to influence um, or augment the nitrifier system um, in this ecosystem and uh, that um, there's no, oh, excuse me, I maybe just misrepresented my results. Um, despite greater nitrogen resources, um, we didn't see um, a predictable change in um, live biomass uh, carbon, stand above ground biomass carbon across temperature, but we did see a change in below ground biomass. Um, I explained that too quickly, and I hope that I can make it clearer in the next piece, which is related to um, the same site. Okay, let's, let's get back to this. Um, so here I'm showing you the Whitaker diagram again. Um, and again, it's um, precipitation and um, temper in a precipitation and temperature space. Another question that I've been interested in in the past is um, how are plant nutrient acquisition traits distributed along these axes of temperature and um, precipitation? So, um, I already kind of explained this uh, spectrum of um, low resource supply to high resource supply um, and the kinds of um, biological traits that we might expect um, to go along with them. Um, so I wanted to ask how um, these 
how what might warming related increases in nitrogen bioavailability, which I showed in my last set of um, results, um, how that might influence or impact um, fine root foraging for phosphorus. So we know that plants require both nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and uh, we and I predicted uh, that the increase in nitrogen bioavailability with warming would also lead to a greater demand for um, phosphorus. And so uh, fine root foraging is one uh, plant nutrient acquisition strategy. Um, another would be um, the association with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae. And so I also wanted to determine whether, fine, uh, whether warming drives a greater fine root uh, association with arbuscular mycorrhizae. Um, and to add to that, um, arbuscular mycorrhizae are um, kind of one major uh, um, kind of strategy for uh, phosphorus acquisition. And, um, and so these two uh, strategies, fine root foraging and um, association with um, arbuscular mycorrhizae are, um, have different costs associated with them in terms of uh, plant carbon. And so um, the demand for nutrients, um, particularly phosphorus in this case, may uh, kind of determine which of these two uh, strategies for phosphorus acquisition would be favorable for the plant. Um, so again, um, I worked on this temperature gradient uh, where we know now from the, from the previous results um, that at cooler temperatures, we have um, lower soil nitrogen availability and at the warmer temperatures, we saw greater uh, nitrogen availability. So to test my questions about fine root um, foraging for phosphorus um, and our buscular mycorrhizal association with those roots, um, I, I deployed uh, root ingrowth cores, which are essentially um, mesh cylinders filled with a medium. And I fertilize those cores with nitrogen, phosphorus, a combination of both nitrogen and phosphorus, and a control that was um, just uh, 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 added with uh, uh, deionized water. And what I looked at um, was um, the ingrowth of roots over a period of 75 days. Um, across uh, nine sites um, on this temperature gradient, um, looking at uh, root length, mass, and colonization by arbuscular mycorrhizae for whatever grew into those cores during that time. And so um, quickly, the, the first um, result was that um, root mycorrhizal colonization, which I measured in terms of percent of the root length that, was, um, that had um, arbuscular mycorrhizal structures, um, which I observed using a microscope. Um, what we found is that our muscular mycorrhizal col colonization of the root did not respond to any of the fertilization treatments, um, but it did increase um, with temperature. So there was greater percent colonization of roots at our warmest site um, compared to the coolest site. And this was not responsive to uh, what was available in terms of the fertilization. So this figure um, can get a little hairy, but I'm gonna do my best um, in explaining it. This is showing, again, mean annual temperature on the x-axis from 13 to 18 degrees Celsius. And um, this figure is a representative of um, the results of a linear mixed effects model um, that is showing um, the response of roots that grew into our cores that were fertilized with nitrogen and phosphorus. And so we're looking at the root length response to that fertilization treatment. And what we've done here um, is separate the responses of, um, of or the, we separated out the response of root length to warm temperatures and high, and, or excuse me, low nitrogen avail nitrate availability and high nitrate availability. So, what we saw is that there was an interaction between temperature and nitrate availability. And um, this visualization of the linear model allows us to um, see how uh, the model predicts root length if we hold nitrate availability at the lowest level, so the lowest naturally observed level, or the highest naturally observed um, nitrate bioavailability that we saw in the study. And so um, the point of this is to visualize that um, root length um, increases 
um, marginally um, when nitrate bioavailability is low. So temperature has this kind of um, really uh, uh, insignificant, um, statistically insignificant effect on um, root length response to N plus P across temperature. Um, but when you hold nitrate bioavailability high, so the highest um, observed nitrate bioavailability um, in this study, um, and look at the response of root length um, to the N plus P fertilization treatment, we see that root length declines significantly um, with warming. And um, this at first was extremely confusing and um, still is and, and likely is to some of you, but I'm gonna do my best to explain um, what I think this result means for, um, for carbon investment um, in fine root foraging. So as we know, <clears throat> let's go back. So fine roots um, seem to be reducing their foraging for nitrogen plus phosphorus in warmer conditions when N is highly available. So if nitrogen is highly available, uh, they're, they're not really going for this N plus P um, uh, patch in the soil. Um, and that's confusing because it was like, uh, well, perhaps um, there's another way that uh, they might be going for phosphorus, but we didn't see a significant response um, in root length to our phosphorus only fertilized uh, cores. And that was also confusing. So when nitrogen is highly available and um, uh, we know that plants would need um, additional phosphorus to compensate that um, high N to P ratio in our soils, um, we still see that fine roots are not really um, growing into the N plus P or P only patches. But what I showed you earlier was that um, our buscular mycorrhizal association with roots increases with temperature, right? And we know that that, um, that AMF, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, are um, one of the major uh, phosphorus acquisition mechanisms for terrestrial plants. So we know that um, in warmer um, N rich environments, there's greater uh, colonization by AMF, even though we see that there's a lower um, or, or lower uh, root length um, for N plus P. So my interpretation of this relatively confusing result is that plants appear to switch strategies um, if we disentangle nitrate bioavailability and temperature, um, we see that in the warmest um, temperatures observed on this gradient, um, which where we know that um, plants are more productive, um, given that we have observed uh, greater um, below ground biomass, uh, biomass um, for live plants, um, we know that there's um, a demand for phosphorus and it appears that rather than continuing to grow their fine roots towards patches of nitrogen plus phosphorus or phosphorus only, plants appear to be um, switching to AMF dominant strategy. And we also know that um, having AMF is carbon costly. So um, my interpretation here is that in a warmer environment that is likely more carbon rich um, uh, due to increased productivity, um, we see that there's a kind of a greater availability to provide a subsidy for AMF in this warmer space. Um, and I hope that uh, some of you reach out with questions because this has always been a really hard piece um, to explain um, just because this uh, interaction between nitrate and temperature can be um, a little confounding, but um, I, I hope that that is sufficient for now. I'll move on. So um, we hypothesize that with, um, with greater carbon availability at warmer temperatures, um, alternative nutrient acquisition strategies can be afforded by plants. Um, and that's, uh, that's because we know that uh, AMF are more costly for phosphorus acquisition, um, but plants may be able to afford it in this warmer environment. Um, we also know that microbial communities are um, shaped um, by, uh, excuse me, microbial communities are shaped in part by plant responses to mean annual temperature. So um, I would have liked to look at um, the general abundance of AMF in soils uh, across the gradient um, rather than only in the roots, um, but that's a study for another time. So those are two pieces of my research that are really focused on um, 
how the abiotic environment is shaping the plant and microbial environment? And those answers are not always extremely clear, but we do understand that there's this reciprocal relationship between um, plants and microbes and that that is um, largely shaped by their, their mineral interactions, um, which is very exciting to me and um, very meaningful for um, what we might predict for future, um, future distributions of um, uh, plant communities, um, as well as the productivity of those plant communities. Um, so I won't be able to say more about that because there's not really enough time, um, but I, I do wanna move on to talk about um, kind of this broader framework of global change research. Um, the, the examples that I just gave are just two pieces of kind of a really big mosaic of global change research. Um, probably some of the people on this call are doing this work. Um, and I look at it um, from a kind of a nutrient exchange perspective. Um, there are a number of other ways to, to consider how um, global change factors, including temperature and moisture uh, changes are impacting biology. Um, and here's kind of my picture of how I think, um, how I think the current um, kind of field of global change uh, research uh, frames itself. Right. So um, just in cartoon format, oversimplified, um, we might start with um, looking at emissions from a point source such as a factory, uh, though there are a number of other kind of point sources of, um, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But for the sake of argument, um, we start with a factory and we see that there's a change in the concentration of greenhouse gases. We know that that has a direct impact on um, uh, warming, and we then kind of um, take warming um, and look at that factor um, in terms of its effect on ecology and evolution. Um, we also think about biogeochemical feedbacks, which I um, discussed a little bit um, earlier. And then we may or may not get into the social um, and economic impact of um, those perturbations. Um, and we, we also may include um, things like sustainability and conservation as kind of responses to um, uh, these uh, ecological perturbations um, and biogeochemical perturbations, right? So this is the, my picture of, um, I think, how um, the field describes the problems that we aim to address largely in this area of ecological and evolutionary perturbations. Um, my kind of question or um, one of the ways in which I have um, felt tension within that uh, setup of how global change operates um, is that we usually kind of um, focus on one piece of, of, this, um, of this continuum um, and we typically don't think about what precedes that, that first step. So we might acknowledge that industrial uh, activity, um, individual use of fossil fuels, um, land use change, our agricultural um, uh, agricultural demand, um, and other uh, kind of uh, human activities influence um, CO2 or other greenhouse gas concentrations, which have an effect on warming. And then we may uh, study organisms or ecosystems that respond to that kind of um, cl uh, climatological change. Um, but my charge is that this before piece, um, the whatever precedes uh, what we're describing as kind of um, an industrial um, uh, or a human activity sort of um, uh, forcing is a really important piece because it uh, really influences um, what happens down, down the line. We know that if there is something in this question mark area and we don't understand it, um, it may have an impact or, and it may have actually a, a sort of um, patterning effect on ecology, evolution, and biogeochemistry. But largely um, our field doesn't uh, acknowledge that as sort of within the purview of what we're allowed to study um, or what is relevant to study. So my argument is that um, this question mark space holds a lot of um, a lot of potential for asking novel questions. 
um, about how the um, ecological um, and evolutionary and biogeochemical um, kind of problems that we, we try to solve um, are patterned and um, where they arise from. So I argue that before this kind of point source of um, what we call kind of anthropogenic disturbance or um, environmental change related to an emission um, come things like social norms, values, and ideologies. Um, patterns of movement, so um, migration, but also colonial and imperial um, uh, activities that uh, we consider historical, but really have an influence on um, kind of the, the advent of a lot of what we describe as um, kind of anthropogenic or anthropocene um, uh, kind of factors. Um, patterns of resource extraction. So before we um, just describe fossil fuel burning, we might also think about the patterns that led to the extraction of those fossil fuels, um, which are related to kind of the development of modern capitalism. Um, and then we might think about the ways in which extraction movement and those ideologies are linked to violence and oppression as social tools. So I know that I should probably slow down and I kind of um, honestly got a little nervous um, getting to this point um, and it kind of threw me off earlier. But I'll say the reason why um, is because in our field of um, biogeochemistry, ecology, environmental change, like actually articulating any of these as um, significant environmental drivers is um, largely heard of. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was kind of anticipating talking about this and going, oh man, here we go. Um, but I'm doing it anyway, because I do believe that without this kind of acknowledgement of um, what precedes our, what, we, what we typically describe as kind of very generalized and glossed over anthropogenic forcings, um, we don't actually have any capacity to um, address uh, and, and potentially mitigate the problems that they have um, brought about. So I argue that the traditional framing of global change ecology um, is incomplete and that it ignores social drivers of biophysical change. So really what I'm arguing is that um, this kind of set of really general terms um, related to how our society structures itself has historically valued um, people as and land um, and has ideologically shaped our relationship to natural resources and land are as important for um, the abiotic and biotic changes um, as the um, kind of uh, what we would consider the, the basic science. Um, so what we would just lump into uh, climate or chemistry or um, kind of species interactions, et cetera. Um, so that's a lot of, of um, stuff at once. And I, and I hope that I can break it down a little bit more in the next couple of minutes. Um, as I introduce um, critical ecology, and, um, and kind of share my argument for um, why we need to fill this gap in the global change research. So I hope I'm doing well on time, first of all. Um, I, I think I'm good, but um, uh, I think you, you're saying 10 minutes, um, Rebecca? It's, okay. Yeah. It's okay, sure, um, I will do my best, um, thank you. So, what I'm arguing for is um, a reorganization of the definitions of global change drivers. So um, this triangle is kind of my brain's representation of um, how the social, the human kind of point, point influences and the kind of basic biophysical drivers of global change stack up together. So at the bottom of the, the um, triangle, we have biophysical drivers and that's really what my uh, earlier part of my talk focused on, how temperature and moisture are these kind of abiotic drivers of biological interactions between plants um, and uh, microbes. And um, I would describe those as primary drivers. Um, so the, the basic um, chemistry um, and physics that influence um, uh, the environmental change, right? Um, but we also know that human activities are influential in, in driving climate change. So um, 
the direct human activities I would describe or in include in this section of the triangle would be things like um, driving your car or um, uh, the extraction of fossil fuels for industrial use. Um, and I would describe these as secondary drivers. So human activities that directly influence atmospheric chemistry. Um, but then I argue that something that global change literature never really touches um, is, is a, a tertiary driver. So the social systems and the logics that actually motivated behavior and actions that led to these human activities. So um, this is typically lumped into the category of social science or, um, uh, or humanities, but I argue that um, by including these questions about how and why social systems um, have motivated behavior and actions that led to human activities, we might actually better understand patterns in the biophysical factors um, and the results therein. And I'm just highlighting here that um, global change research basically only focuses on primary drivers. And while that is incredibly important and, um, and even in and of itself, sometimes intractable, um, it's insufficient for actually addressing the, the needs that um, society is facing so direly now. So um, I would argue that a restructuring of that um, linear model of, of um, kind of human activity, uh, climate change, and um, ecological and evolutionary perturbations would actually be a circular model. So my, my framing um, offers this kind of um, cyclical global socio-ecological change um, uh, shape. Um, and what I suggest is that here between um, ecological change and past and present social oppression and harm um, is an opportunity to um, intervene uh, between what we know uh, can be kind of a, a feedback between uh, ecological change, um, increasingly severe um, ecological and, uh, um, and environmental impacts on uh, certain communities that are disproportionately harmed. Um, and we might be able to, um, we might be able to uh, intervene by addressing this relationship between the kind of um, anthropogenic forcings, which I'm representing here as a, a factory, um, and the past and present social harm piece. Um, sustainability and conservation are typically kind of um, the response to how we deal with all of these environmental crises that are being faced um, and how we apply our basic research to the societal aspects. But I argue that um, these two interventions are, are really um, ineffectual if they're not coupled with a sort of critique of this past and present social um, oppression and harm piece. So understanding the antecedents of human activity that lead to atmospheric change and that then have these basic biophysical impacts on ecology um, will allow us to, to better um, address the kind of um, really dire ecological and social outcomes that we, we continue to face. So I'm just going to quickly move. I know we, I have almost no time, but I want to just offer one example um, of a project that um, my group, the Critical Ecology Lab, is, um, is getting started right now that kind of exemplifies this issue. So um, the, the project is a critical ecology of slave-based monoculture in the Dutch colony of St. Croix. So this is a, um, a project looking at the past, um, but I think it really has significant implications for how we think about future global change. So we know that um, that the transatlantic slave trade brought um, many, many human beings across the Atlantic um, to um, the Caribbean and St. Croix in particular received about 26,000 um, slaves um, over time um, in total. And I'm interested in how the enslavement of Africans um, for sugarcane monoculture on this island um, and the cane refinement for rum production has spatially influenced soil structure and organic carbon in soils in St. Croix. So um, the reason I asked this question, oh, and I also am interested in how um, this activity influenced plant community structure and function over time. And so I'm treating um, the importation of human beings and using those human beings for, um, as agricultural tools in the kind of Dutch uh, colonial um, project as um, physical drivers of land use change and, um, and also uh, soil uh, biogeochemistry. Um, and so so I'm, I'm really interested 
in reframing um, something as simple or what is typically seen as um, just agricultural land use change and reframing it in terms of the, um, the use of uh, slavery as um, a land use change tool uh, with direct impacts on um, soils and um, plant communities in, on the island. And so this work is happening on the estate Little Princess in St. Croix, which is a former um, Dutch uh, plantation and is now owned by the Nature Conservancy as um, preserved land. Um, and so just using the same framework that I did, uh, that I introduced earlier, I would say that the, the primary drivers, so these biophysical drivers down at the bottom would be um, uh, the physical impacts on soil structure and plant community over time that we could look at from sort of a basic global change science perspective. But what I add to it is that the secondary driver would be the colonial uh, landscape change and cropping techniques, which we can derive from historical records. Um, and then I would add to that analysis that um, we're really framing it under this tertiary driver of the transatlantic slave trade having this direct impact on um, soil biogeochemistry and um, uh, plant uh, ecology. Um, I put a bunch of methods here and I won't talk about them because I know that I'm driving someone crazy on here because I'm uh, talking still. Um, and no, that, that was it. <laughs> um, I, I will uh, just say that um, these methods um, rely on inter interdisciplinary collaborations um, between um, archaeologists who have been working at the estate Little Princess for many years, um, as well as um, my background in soil biogeochemistry and um, plant ecology. Um, but I won't take up more time and I'll just save it for questions if we even have time for that. Um, and Finally, I just wanna um, give an opportunity to say, what is the Critical Ecology Lab? What, why does it exist? And, um, and why is this woman talking about it and rushing through this talk? Well, um, the point of the Critical Ecology Lab is, is that uh, it is both like a traditional research lab group um, doing uh, collaborative peer-reviewed peer research um, using um, the techniques that um, traditional ecologists and biogeochemists use. Um, and um, doing kind of the uh, academic outreach work, um, but we also are a not-for-profit organization that um, is operating outside of the academy in, in some ways, um, and we are working to um, co-create our research with relevant communities um, in the spaces um, that, that we have the opportunity to work um, and introducing these new frameworks to you all. Um, so I'm just going to uh, stop because I'm uh, surely over time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for an amazing talk. It's, it's really interesting um, the work you, you like, explained today. Um, I'm sure I can speak for everyone that has really like so many layers of information. And uh, just for everyone know, like if you guys wanna ask a question, please type a question mark in the chat and I will call by your name and you can open your mic and ask questions. For now, I can tell you, Suzanne, you have uh, messages, uh, claps, uh, very, everyone very excited. Rania Bell says, so excited to work with you. Thank you, Sue. Um, and if anyone has questions, please type a, a question mark again. Um, until uh, we wait or attendees to warm up, I do have a question. Or Shannon, do you have a question? Yeah, I was, okay. Sure. Um, I was going to ask, so as a virologist, I think about how viromes shape bacterial communities, and I can only imagine uh, the influence of, of human beings from different um, uh, backgrounds and accessibility interactions with nature, how it's going to very greatly influence not only um, the microbes, uh, microbial uh, players driving the abiotic factors, but the microbial diversity writ large, including the phage community that's regulating that. And I'm, uh, I wonder if you have any comments or lenses about looking at, at larger microbial diversity spectra, and if we can collaborate on anything like that would be great. Um, that is a great, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I have some thoughts about it, and I'll share just briefly one example of how um, I might uh, kind of ask, ask a a critical ecology question relating um, uh, the virome to the microbiome. Um, so one example of a project that I and my collaborator, Kanal, um, who's shown here on the slide, um, are, are thinking about and planning right now is um, regarding the distribution of microbial communities in the atmosphere and how um, atmospheric chemistry 
um, as it is distributed differently um, in space um, and and um, across uh, kind of um, human uh, community distributions um, may uh, be be sort of shaped by um, how, let me fix that. <laughs> um, how the distribution of microbial communities in the atmosphere may be shaped by um, atmospheric chemistry, which we know um, sort of historically is related to um, who lives where, right? Um, like which communities um, appear kind of spatially. Um, and so the, aero, the research on um, the aerobiome already exists. Um, it's kind of a, a nascent area of um, microbial ecology, but um, is growing. And we know that there are differences um, in urban versus rural um, kind of air, air chemistry spaces. And that, that may have um, a relationship to um, the um, microbial community composition in the atmosphere. Um, I don't think I know enough about phage to say more <laughs> um, about how um, they might be uh, relating to the um, kind of, uh, um, yeah, community composition of, of microbes. But um, I think that is a more advanced question than um, the aerobiome space even is asking right now. So it's um, potentially a really interesting um, question to say, you know, how are, how are viruses and how are bacteria and archaea um, kind of spatially interacting um, with relation to atmospheric chemistry? Um, I'd be very curious to know. Now that's a great answer and thank you so much and, and thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Susan, you have more uh, like people congratulating you and, and uh, saying this fascinating work where you're doing. Um, I, ha I have one question. Uh, I couldn't, I work with coral reef and I also did microbial ecology for my PhD. So it's fascinating to see the parallelism between the two ecosystems. And I couldn't yeah. avoid to think uh, that I was wondering if some of the results you're seeing and a bit like complementing what Shannon said, mm -hmm. if uh, with, with both the gene as well as the response to carbon uh, in plants, mm -hmm. how much of that could be a, a, a resilient response of the ecosystem in trying to adjust to those um, changes in temperature? And how much do you think that bar could be bent? Mm -hmm. Like, because we are increasing the temperature, right? Like that's not stopping yeah. um, and eventually that bar you know, won't resist. So if you have any comment about that. Um. Yeah, that's a, so, so um, I, thank you for that question, Ale. Um, so I, I kind of take this uh, um, like resource economics perspective. I think I've kind of um, alluded to that, but um, it kind of comes from the, the ecological stoichiometry literature, um, thinking about how, um, basically plants are, are moving their carbon around um, in response to um, deficits in resource availability in the environment. And I can really only speak to it from the terrestrial plant um, system, but I'm sure that it has applications to the marine environment. Um, but uh, I guess I, I think about how um, temperature is, is, um, is influencing the microbial community and um, their functions for nutrient availability. But um, in turn, the biology is responding by kind of sh shifting um, carbon as a resource to um, uh, kind of compensate for whatever is um, lacking most. And I, I, I don't have a, a clear answer for how this might um, relate to kind of um, long-term ecological resilience. But um, I think that this is an important feature of ecological resilience is this kind of baseline um, kind of bi biological ability to kind of uh, um, respond um, honestly within both within the, the you know singular lifetime of one organism physiologically as well as um, you know plastically um, uh, in time um, in terms of uh, taxa I think that this the for me the the most useful lens for how um, ecosystems probably ter both terrestrial and um, aquatic, um, are, are resilient is through this kind of mechanism of, um, of like compensatory ecological stoichiometry. So um, I, I, I don't know if that's useful for um, the coral reef uh, environment, but um, it's certainly like a, a helpful um, lens for, for terrestrial environments for me. 
Thank you so much for your answer. Yeah, indeed, like well, Coras don't do well with uh, high temperature, but yes, it's a. I, I just hope that we never reach that point when you know that that um, resilience resistance it's it's not enough to keep up. No. Um, okay, so we're running a bit over time now. Um, everyone's like saying wonderful talk. Thank you for your talk. And Shannon is inviting everyone to go to the happy hour and she uh, copy and paste the link there. I don't know if you have to, but you can see it in the chat. Oh, she's ready. <laughs> um, thank you very much everyone for staying. I also gonna uh, read Rebecca Johnson comment and invite everyone for next week. There's another talk, same place, same time by Christina Douglas, who will be talking about human environment dynamics in Madagascar. And, and Rebecca is saying that it will be a good complement to today's talk. Thank you everyone for staying um, and for coming, of course. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you soon. Thank you, Sue, for an amazing, an amazing talk. Really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thanks so much, Sue.